Well, we are in the third week of our series called Heaven and Nature Sing, and what we are doing during this Advent time are we are using some of the songs that are most familiar to us, some of the songs of our faith during this time of year as jumping off points into understanding how God would have us to prepare for the coming of this Christ child. And so we've looked at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel in the first week, and we talked about how Emmanuel means God with us, Right. And so we are waiting for God to be with us. We, we know that Christmas has already occurred, but yet we celebrate it every single year. Why? Because we need the reminder that this Christ, this Christ child is born again each and every day into our hearts and lives and into this world. And we carry that forward and forth as Christians. Last week, we looked at God rest ye merry gentlemen. And we looked at the story of the angel appearing to the shepherds where this song was written from. And we talked about how we've actually kind of missed the meaning over the years when we think that it means we get to be during Christmas restful and then also just kind of be happy. How many of you have a nice restful Christmas coming down the pipe? Right? Yeah, like one person. That's just Sam. And that probably means Peggy's doing all the work, right? Good job, Sam. All right. That's right. I find on my most restful days are not restful for long because I get reminded of how I was not doing all the things I shouldn't have been restful for. And so, uh, but we, we enter this time, we don't really enter it restfully. We talked about how it actually means God keep you mighty people of God. And so we remember that during this time of year and the angel coming to the shepherds, remember the first thing the angel says is do not be afraid. A baby is born, this child that will change the entire trajectory of Christmas. That is not a message that says, I hope you get to rest and be happy. It's a message that says, keep mighty the brilliance of this Christ child, the pivotal moment of human history is occurring. The weapons will be beat into plowshares. The lion will lay with the lamb. It is time for peace and justice and righteousness and love and joy and faith and all the goodness of life. And it hasn't come to its fullest fruition yet, but we as the people of God keep mighty and we bring it into the everyday aspects of our lives. And today we're going to be looking at We Three Kings, and uh, I heard a great story. Nelson, do you mind if I share about your Christmas card? I put you on the spot, so it's kind of hard to say no now. <laughs> Nelson was telling me about how when they had Charlie, their first child, they put on the card, uh, We Three Beams, <laughs> right? Instead of We Three Kings. And so, uh, so anyway, I thought that was hilarious the other day. Charlie was the first one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just, I had a fear that I didn't get it right, and I was, you know, just feeling bad. Okay. But today we're going to look at this idea of we three kings, and this is an interesting scripture because it actually doesn't come up during the build-up towards Advent. It's actually part of what we would call epiphany, and that usually comes in. It's actually the first Sunday of the new year, typically, and so that would actually be Epiphany Sunday, but we are looking at it because whether we like it or not, it's a part of our traditional understanding of Christmas, the, the magi that are coming in, the three wise men, the song calls them three kings, and here they are coming. Epiphany just simply means that the divine revelation of God has come to be in front of humanity, that humanity has had a forthcoming of divinity, and that's what we mean when we say Epiphany. Now, if I were trying to come up with a cutesy title, I would call this the fourth first gift sermon. It's kind of like a one and two thirds bank. And, you know, for those who are bad at math, that's fifth thirds bank, right? This is the fourth first gift sermon today. And so we're going to be looking at that just a little bit. Now, I want to share with you, we three kings, and now we're going to do like we did last week. You can stay seated, but I'm going to get you to sing the chorus with us. <laughs> Kathy's going to lead it in this. So let's sing the chorus one time so we get used to it. Let's throw that chorus up on the screen for me, please, Daniel. <clears throat> and you ready? You're going to lead that part? I'm going to let you lead that part. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, oh, star of wonder, star of night. Star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. All right, we're going to work on tempo next time. All right, we three kings of Orient are... (laughs) What? Mike, has my mic been off the whole time or just now? Okay, I thought y'all were all just like smiling and nodding, having no idea what I said. They're like, if we smile and nod, he'll get done faster. That's good. No, no. She said you get to take it since you're so good at it. That's right. All right. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse afar. 
Field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Frankincense to offer I have, incense owns a deity nigh, prayer and praising, voices raising, worshiping God on high. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrow, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sounds through the earth and skies. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading still proceed. All right, good job. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Give yourselves a round of applause. You did excellent. Way to go. So as we sing this song, it reminds us of many of the highlights of this story. We sing about the star, right? We sing about the wise men coming in and the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And we think about how far they must have traveled, these, these kings from the east. And we don't know how far east that might be or how far they would have come from, right? There's traditions we have that bring into play things that we find outside of Scripture. But we think about how far these people may have come and who and why they are, they are coming to see this Christ child. And so today I want us to walk through this scripture here in Matthew 2 together, and I want us to look at it a little bit as we go along because the the framework for kind of our, our message this morning comes straight from kind of the framework of what is brought out in the scriptures. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. Now what do you notice about that first scripture? There's a lot of information in there. Why is any of that information important? Now let's remember, scholars, theologians, you, that each of these Gospels is written with a different audience from a different author. And who is the book of Matthew written for? It's written for the Jews, right? We look at Luke, and it's written for the Gentiles. It's speaking to people who are outside of the Jewish faith. It has to kind of explain things as it goes along. But this is church people talking to church people. So in this first verse, he does all of the framework to set up who this Christ child really is. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Why is Bethlehem significant? It was in the scriptures, but it's the city of David. Why is it important that Jesus would be born in the city of David? Because he's in the line of David. If you flip back to Matthew 1, we walk through the genealogy of Jesus tying him to David. He moves to Judea where the rule of King Herod is happening. These magi, they come from the east and they travel to Jerusalem. They asked, meaning the magi, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. Now, I want to tell you, this question is scandalous. Do you know one of the titles for Herod? 
king of the Jews. One of the titles for Herod was king of the Jews. And here these so-called wise men come into Jerusalem. Now you notice they didn't go straight to Bethlehem, did they? They went to Jerusalem. And what was their question? Where's the king of the Jews? You see, they didn't go straight to Bethlehem where the star may have been leading them. Perhaps the star wasn't leading them to that point. Perhaps the star took them to Jerusalem first. Wouldn't that be interesting? Why did there need to be conflict with Herod before they got to the Jesus, the Christ child that was born in Bethlehem? Bethlehem's a stone's throw from Jerusalem. It's not far at all, especially in our modern times with the size of the city. But even for them, it's not that far. He comes to Jerusalem, he asks, where is this Christ child? And we have come to honor him. Now this, this word or these words, honor him, appear three times in our text today. And they are at the root, at the heart of what is going on. They are the eye of the storm, so to speak, that is, that is happening and will be happening with the birth of Jesus. And it means to worship, to bow down, to give oneself to These wise men come and they say, where is the king of the Jews so that we may give ourselves to him? But we know automatically from the way that they say it that they are not talking about King Herod. They did not come to say the east wants to bow down to you, Herod. You're not even really king. You're actually king under Caesar Augustus, right? But you have actually come. We have come to you. No, it says the newborn king of the Jews. From the onset, they have set themselves at odds. I would willing to venture a bet that these men knew exactly Herod's titles. If they were truly wise men, they had heard it before. And coming into a land, you wouldn't go into a ruler's own place and household and use their titles to define someone else. That would be a recipe for your own tragedy. Now, King Herod, he's a smart ruler. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled. And every one in Jerusalem was troubled with him. Now, we understand why King Herod would be troubled, right? I'm the king, and I say I've come, somebody comes to me and says, I've come to talk to the newborn king of the Jews. And you're like, I didn't have any kids. <laughs> and I was born a long time ago. Like, in the East, what's your definition of newborn? Do we need to talk about some translation problems? No, no, I mean someone who's not you. Someone who's been born to take your place. You are now, as a matter of fact, you are now no longer the king of the Jews, and I have come to talk and seek that one. So we know why Herod would be worried. Why are all the people worried? Why is, I mean, they use an infinitive here, right? Everyone was troubled. Why was everyone troubled? (coughs) Say that again. King's King's not happy, nobody's happy. Were you listening, Lloyd? (laughs) This is the absolute truth. What would happen? What would happen in a world where the king's authority was called into question? What would happen between a people who were looking at their other king, who was now no longer the ruler from Rome? What would begin to happen? Insurrection. Rising up. We know the end of the story. You see, we're going to stop at verse 12 today, but, but we now know, looking back, what happens in verse 13. And Herod murders children because of his fragile ego. Everyone was worried. And they knew, as was, is predicted here in this verse, but we find in verse 13 and on, that they knew the truth. That calling into question Herod's authority and his kingship would mean murder. I'm not sure they knew it would mean their children, but they knew it would mean someone. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. Now, I I find this significant as well. The, The people from the east come and ask the people in Jerusalem where this newborn king of the Jews are. They were the ones who were looking for the newborn king of the Jews. It turns out the Jewish people at that time, they weren't looking for him. I don't know if they didn't see the star. They didn't believe it. They didn't know what was happening. Maybe they needed a gospel like Marx to interpret it in their language, what was going on. But the people from the east come to the Jews, ask them where the king is. And then the king of that land has to ask the priests 
where this king would be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because you will come one from, because from you one will come who governs, who will shepherd the people of Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and found out from them the time when the star first appeared. I mean, we, we've got geography, the place is important. We've got the players in the game, we've got the West and the East. We've got the magi and the priest and the religious people. We've got the king under the Caesar. And now we even have the time, the who, what, when, where, and how is coming into focus in this story, and it is creating a storm. And in the midst of it, we know all the while there is this child, this baby, this innocent, this helpless thing, even though it's God, it's such a conundrum, but it is waiting in the wings while the rest of civilization and the rest of the known world is swirling in anxiety and fear. Everyone is troubled. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, and this is one of the scriptures that I really think plays well in our modern time as well. Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. How did Herod honor the birth of the Christ child? By murdering everyone else's. But you see, since the very beginning, people have tried to repurpose Jesus for their own personal gain. It's been happening since Jesus was born. It's been happening since the first people came to seek and to worship. He's willing to use the language. You catch that, right? He uses the exact language they use. We have come to pay him homage. We have come to honor him. We have come to worship him. And he says, of course, me too. Go and find him. I want to honor him, to pay him homage, to worship him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, falling to their knees. They honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route." The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Since the beginning of this Christ story, we as people have been fascinated with things that aren't the point of this story. Even our song this morning is fascinated with things that aren't really the point of this story. How many wise men are in our scriptures today? It doesn't say. Christian tradition has assumed there were three wise men because there is gold, frankincense, and myrrh addressed. It could have been one. It could have been 40. We don't know how many it is. Also, they were not kings. The word for king is used nowhere. The only time word for king is used is the king of the Jews, who Christ would be. These were magi, astrologers, people who would have been wealthy in their own right, but who looked to the stars to find divine action. They were people who looked to the stars. Have you ever looked to the stars? Have anybody ever taken an astrology class? You know, what's, you know what I found out when I took an astrology class in college? One, I was never going to become an astrologer. <laughs> I don't know what the market is for that anyway, but, <clears throat> but I found out that it's pretty boring. It doesn't change. So the appearance of a star, that's something. It's passed by year after year, month after month with no change. As a matter of fact, you can literally set your watch to it quite literally. But yet all of a sudden there's a change. Now we in Christian tradition have become fascinated. Was it a neutron star? Was it a burst of gas? What was it that caused this thing? And we have offered explanations from the beginning of time, but that's not the point. The star is not the point. We have been fascinated with what isn't the point. Where? Of course it's important. It happened in the city of David, Bethlehem. You see, in Matthew, we now know that that is extremely significant for the Jews. Who is this? It's these wise men, the Gentiles. It is absolutely scandalous. The people from the east, the people who should not be looking for the Messiah, had to come to the people who were looking for the Messiah and tell them the Messiah had been born. It is scandalous. 
And they did so by standing in the face of the all-governing authority of the day in all of the known world and saying, you are no longer king. That is the birth of the Christ child. The powers of this world are no longer king. The things that we thought were important, the things that we thought would rule, the things that we thought we should be afraid of, they are not the point. I love how the wise men, I think there's a great metaphor here, the wise men, after seeing the Christ child, they do not return to the powers of this world. When they see the star, they understand it to be divine interaction in this world, that creation is crying out, quite literally, heaven and nature sing because this Christ child is born. And when Herod asks, who is this child? All of history begins to answer. Now, you see, we've been fascinated with shiny objects, fragrant gifts, and staving off death. You see, these are the gifts that the wise men offer. But Jesus is here at the center, caught in this tornado of powers from the east and the west, of money and objects, of stars and nature, everything, all of creation yearns and groans and swirls around this innocent child, this baby who has come to change the entirety of the world. Everything else has been laid to waste. It turns out the land is not sacred, but it points to the truth of Jesus. It turns out that the time is important. What year was it when Jesus was born? Yeah, zero, right? One a trick question, I promise. You probably remember your birthday. You probably remember your spouses. Sometimes you might have trouble with your kids. But you roll it back a little bit further. But all of history knows the day, the year that Jesus was born. The time is important, but it's only important because it points to something else. The rulers of the time, the gifts that are brought, the star in the sky, they all point to what is sacred And we find it in this 11th verse. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasures. Falling to their knees, they honored him. And then they opened their treasures. You see, people of God, we come to this place today not because of the star or the wise men or the kings or the gold and the frankincense and myrrh, Not because of any of that. We come because we are offering the gift that so often we have put forth, but the gift that the wise men offer first. They offer themselves. They walk into the house, they see the Christ child, they get on their knees and they worship him. They kneel and submit themselves to who he is. Before there were gifts, there were their whole selves. And my beautiful people of God, that is who we are. That is what this season means. The Christ child has come, is here. The kingdom of God is upon us. And we, the people of God, submit our lives, submit the wholeness of ourselves to what it means to be, to worship this Christ child. And so this morning, we are going to close by singing our We Three Kings hymn, and we're going to sing it together. But this morning, I invite you to submit your life, to bow and pay homage to who Jesus Christ is. (coughs) This mysterious child, this divine presence come to earth, God Almighty in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, we give our lives to this Christ. The prayer rails are open for you today to come and to do just that. If you would like for me to pray with you, you simply cup your hands and I would love to pray with you. If you want to know what it means more to submit your life to who Jesus Christ is, I would love to have that conversation with you over coffee anytime. You just come down here or let me know afterwards or whatever it is. Let us stand and let us sing. We three kings.